Well, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm really excited today to be talking with Dr. Jeff. And for those of you who are not familiar with him, he is a veterinarian in Canada. And he, at some point in his career, became a bit more holistic oriented. And today we're going to talk about a topic that I actually am pretty passionate about as well, which is um, talking about vaccines and over vaccinating and how we can check titers. So I'm excited to get into this with Dr. Jeff. So Dr. Jeff, just tell my viewers that may not be familiar with you, just give us a little bit of your background and what got you started in holistic veterinary medicine. Sure. And no, it's, you know, it's great, great being here, Angel. The, uh, I've, I've been a vet for, and the number is scary now, it's before you were born, 41 years. And uh, the, um, the about 15 years into it, it was like, I think there's another way of doing this. <laughs> and so uh, I actually went to a, a talk and listened to uh, uh, a guy talk about this alternative stuff. And it was like, oh, that's really quite interesting. And so it ended up, I took an acupuncture course. And that was my, that was my introduction to alternative therapies. And then it was ag ag acupuncture, chiropractic, got into a few herbs courses. And then but the main thing is it changed the way I practiced. And that is nutrition wise, you can imagine, it was like, gee, we can do better than feeding commercial food. Uh, but the other side is, it's like, uh, why are we doing vaccines so often? And you can imagine when I was looking at switching, it was when the vaccine field changed completely. Right. And so so that was the, the opportunity to really find out what what we should be doing. You know, and anyway, the holistic thing just kept going. I practiced for the last 25 years of my practice. I practiced with my wife, a veterinarian. And, uh, and by the end of it, we were, as most of the vets around us um, commented to us, we were getting really weird. And um but it, it fit, but it felt good to us. That was the whole point. And uh, and since then, I've been teaching, and it's through newearthvet.com, and I've got courses and things. So, and then my point is, I want to teach people so that they can learn this stuff because they're not getting it from their veterinarians. Yep, so true, definitely. Yeah. 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 And uh, talking about vaccines. So like a little bit of my background, um, I actually have a, a master's degree in veterinary pathobiology and I did work on vaccine developments when I was in grad school. And that's when it really became an eye opener for me because I realized that the pharmaceutical companies were not really into finding a vaccine that was the most effective or the safest um, or, you know, the most affordable even. They were more pushing mm -hmm. us to to develop something that would need a lot of boosters that they could vaccinate. Like this was for chickens, for example, they wanted to vaccinate each chick rather than vaccinating the hen and having that be passed on to the chicks. So I realized then just how much it's profit driven and how everything in the pharmaceutical companies is just all about more or less making money. Um, so that's what kind of got me more on the holistic spin as well. But yeah, just tell us, um, tell us a little bit about, about what got you um, into checking titers and not wanting to over vaccinate. Did you have some particular cases where you saw animals have some reactions to over vaccination? The, uh, well, yeah, uh, the, the, the main thing that was the thrust of it, it if, and I'm going back in time here, 1995, the American Association of Feline Practitioners came out with guidelines that guys, rather than every year, let's do them every three years. And it was, and that for a lot of veterinarians, that was a blasphemy. Um, and that is like, well, how can we do that? Well, the point is the vaccines last that long. And the reason they did that is because the vaccines were, were linked to causing a tumor in cats called a feline fibrosarcoma. Um, the, uh, so anyway, that was the genesis of the whole thing of, gee, maybe, vac maybe vaccines aren't as safe as we think they are. Okay. And uh, I mean, we already knew that vaccines could cause allergic reactions. They're obvious, the face swells up, that type of thing. Um, but they usually live. You know, that's the thing about that. But the things that started really being tied to it was uh, bone diseases, where you get inflammatory bone issues, uh, uh, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, where the body decides, I'm going to kill all my red blood cells and, and more or less in human terms, we call it, and drop the iron content and bingo, you've got an anemic uh, dog, right? 
and that's and that that's that's dog stuff, you know. And um, so it was like, gee, we've really got these things, and but these are only happening relatively quickly after the vaccines. Okay, um, the things that are really uh, drive home is when you start looking at well, why do we, do we see so many dogs with uh, allergies? And the immune systems are stimulated by the vaccines. And we know if we vaccinate during an allergic time, dogs get worse. Okay. And so there's not a far, it's not a far jump to say, well, are vaccines actually triggering this in the first place? And then we have that speak scary thing called cancer. And we see so much of it. And uh, the links to, to vaccines are certainly there. Not, so not just for the injection causing what it in cats, but overall messing up the immune system. So you don't get, as we term it, you don't get surveillance. It's not killing off the pre, the, I call it the, the baby cancer cells when it should be. Okay. So vaccines, we figured out, hey, the, these guys are really a problem and we shouldn't be doing that many vaccines that often. Okay. So the answer became, well, let's reduce them. And the uh, the way we were doing that was, number one, the a lot of vets moved to a three-year schedule. What they didn't read in the vaccine guidelines that were out at that time was the small print. And the small print says in dogs that the core vaccines, distemper, parvo, are good for nine years. So it's written right there. You know, it's kind of like, did you guys miss that part? You know, um, but meanwhile, what they, and it was a compromise. What the vaccine guideline creators did is they put in the thing saying, you could, you can, you should be doing them every three years or longer between the time. Okay. Every veterinarian from, you know, that was moving off a one year schedule said, oh, this means three years. Now they didn't, they didn't extend it at all. And, but when I read it, it was like, hey, we can really reduce these vaccines. Why don't we look at doing that? Okay. So that was sort of the big the big part, you know, and that is rather than doing them so like annually, and this is scary, about 40% of that still vaccinate annually. And a lot of owners, unfortunately, think that that's what they need to be doing because a lot of the vets kind of guilt them into it. You know, you're not a good pet owner if you're not doing yeah. your annual vaccines. So a lot of them... I just had a dog come to me the other day that had severe neurological issues. Same the older, uh, a lab or actually a boxer that's uh, over 12 years old and just had its yearly vaccines. And I'm thinking, yeah. why would they be doing that at this point? So, Yeah. Well, when we think of the human experience, um, I mean, when I was a little tiny guy, um, I got vaccines for, you know, measles, polio, you know, things like that. And when you think about it, how many polio vaccines have I had since I was a midget? None. Zero. Okay. And so there's this thing called lifetime immunity. Okay. Not maybe not completely with the bacterial vaccines. That's a different story. But with the viral vaccines, especially the ones that we have that are modified live, that propagate, multiply in the host, and create a really, as we call it, robust immune response. We don't need to keep giving those, okay? So, so, so that's that part. But the other thing is, uh, there's a concept that I've used for years, uh, and uh, this is dogs and cats, but we'll, we'll stick with dogs because it's simpler. Uh, and that is the puppies usually get their vaccines at 8, 12, 16 weeks, and sometimes even 20, okay? And do you know the reason for those repeated vaccines, Angel? Uh, to boost their tighter, more or less, their antibodies? Not quite. It's because of interference from the maternal antibodies. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's true. So, so in the beginning, they will have... So yeah. so, so little little pup pepperonis get their immunity, their antibodies from mom. Mm -hmm. And they get it in more or less two sources, through the, through the colostrum, the first milk, and also through the, the uterus, okay? But anyway, the point is, from that moment on, they have immunity, and that protects them from disease for a while. The problem is those antibodies also mess up the vaccine response, and that is if there's enough antibodies, they go and attack where the vaccine was just given and say, hey, take a break, body. You don't need to wake up yet, okay? 
So what happens is that if you give a vaccine to pups at eight weeks of age, 50% of them will not respond to it. That's normal, totally normal. Okay? By the time you've moved up to 12 weeks, only 25% don't respond. The maternal antibodies are going down, so the puppies have to respond to it. Okay, And by the time you get 16 weeks, 5%. Okay, so that sort of tells you, that's why you keep doing those, those boot, cool, they call them boosters, which is wrong. They're actually vaccinations. And uh, what's happening is the body responds to it. And from then on, they have their own immunity that protects them from that moment. Um, so if you want to do just one vaccine and you want to make sure that it works. Do it later. We do it at 16 weeks yeah. or older. Let's say 16 weeks, okay? And and here's the, the so that, that's one side, and that is, gee, if we do that, then we've got this vaccine given, and, oh, yeah, the guidelines said not, it's good for nine years. And the world's small animal veterinarian said nine years, comma, and possibly a lifetime. Whoa. Nobody refers to that one. Um, so the key is this. Then we got this thing introduced called titers. And uh, the, 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 a lot of people don't know what titers are. And what, what's your concept on that one? Well, for me personally, um, a titer is looking for certain antibodies against a certain disease. So if you do a rabies titer, uh, for example, you're looking to see how many antibodies are present against the rabies virus. And you can check titers for, for different diseases. Correct. Yeah, okay. you, you got it. Yeah, it, it's a, a titer is a measure of the antibody level to a specific disease. In this case, we're talking about diseases we vaccinated for, distemper and parvo, those two. Okay. Yeah, you can do hepatitis, but that's irrelevant. It doesn't even exist in North America. Okay. But anyway, distemper parvo. And so what you're doing is you're saying, hey, we've found antibodies there. What that tells you, this is the, this is the, Overall, most important point of this whole talk here. When you get a titer that's got some antibodies, what it tells you is that the immune system has come on board and said, we recognize that vaccine and we produce cells that created the antibodies that killed that vaccine. Okay. That's those cells. It's what's called a clone of cells. And that is, it's a group of cells in the immune system, and they're called B lymphocytes, beta lymphocytes. And what they're doing is they're, they're producing antibodies to that one bug and can think of it as distemper, okay? Those cells persist for life. And that is the concept of something called memory. And this is, that's, the, that's the whole basis of me being protected from polio. Okay, my immune system has a memory. If I were to be exposed to polio tomorrow, my immune system would, that's kind of asleep on it right now, would kind of go, I think I remember that guy. And then they produce antibodies and protect me and I don't die from it. Okay. Correct. Let me that's ask mean. you this though, because I've had um, veterinarians even say that there's not really good guidelines out there that explain what titer is needed to be adequately protective. So for example, like if the titer level yes. drops as the animal ages, they're saying that it's hard mm -hmm. to find what a guideline that will say, okay, this is a protective titer. So we don't need to revaccinate because the animal has enough antibodies. But their argument is that there's really no scientific research on that on what what is enough basically. Okay. The, the whole thru thrux of that part is, it's totally irrelevant what the level is. Uh, because, because what you're saying is if they're exposed to it in the future, they will boost their antibody levels anyway. Yes, yeah. yeah. And here's, here's the key. This is, and this is, this is the problem of how titers have been used. A lot of veterinarians replace vaccination with a titer. Mm -hmm. uh, saying, oh, well, you're due for a vaccine every three years, but instead we'll do a titer. And if it's high enough, we won't do it then, but we'll retest in three years' time. Okay? So a lot of them just replace it. And they get this guidance from the, the uh, lab 
that says, oh, if it hits, go, it gets below the certain level. And what they're doing is they're measuring the antibody level. It's usually based on one in 50, one in 100 or something like that. Okay, Every lab is different on what number they consider protective. Um, but this is the key. And this, this is the problem with titers. They're not using them the correct way that they should be. And what, the, what we should be doing with it, and this comes from the immunologists, not the lab people that are selling titer tests. There's the difference, okay? Think of the lab replacing the pharmaceutical companies here, okay? And, and so what happens is that if we, we, we give, we're going to give that vaccine at 16 weeks to our little pup. A month later, we do a titer. Because that's when the highest level is going to be right then. Okay, so it's the best chance of finding out did they respond. We get that level, and it, like I say, the number doesn't matter. What we're looking for is did we get a response to the vaccine? And what we then say is, hey, yeah, we got a response based on the concept of memory. That's why I already brought this out. <laughs> then we can say we've got an immune system that's on board. We know there's memory cells. We don't need to revaccinate this kid. Okay, so that's one side. The other side is titers. We've got a level of one in 200, say, okay, because we just vaccinated, it probably will be at least that high. So we've got a level of one in 200. And then what we do is we go, great. What's going to happen over time is that we're going to start up here and the level of antibodies in the bloodstream is going to do that. It's going to go down. Guaranteed, okay? Uh, and so what's happening is that those cells are going, well, there's no immediate threat anymore I, and I haven't been revaccinated. So we're just going to start to go get a bit sleepy, okay? And the level goes never down to zero. It gets down to the level that the, that lab test doesn't detect to that, okay? Because okay. they'll immediately say, well, we test at one in 20 and we don't test below that because we want one in 20. Okay, so there's always going to be something there. But the, the whole concept is that even if that thing is undetectable on that test, we already know where we stand. And so two things. If we've got a positive antibody titer a, week, a month after that, that vaccine, what that means is we don't need to do another titer and we don't need to do another vaccine. So if somebody brings a dog to you that you have not known since puppyhood, like say they adopt an older dog and they're mm -hmm. questioning yeah. whether they should vaccinate, do you run a titer then and see, or do you assume it's been vaccinated? How do you deal with that one? You've, you've got those two, both those ideas are totally valid. Uh, one, okay. If I know that that dog has had vaccines in the past, then I'm very comfortable saying one of them should have taken hold. Okay, especially if it was done three years ago and it's a ten-year-old dog, right? Um, as in, yeah, we can yeah, if we make we can pretty well make an assumption that it's it's okay. If we're unsure, or if we want to get some validity to this, then we do a titer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's and interesting because a lot of people think with the titers, like you said, that they would have to go in every few years and check their dog's titer again. Yeah. But as you're saying is you check it initially because you want to make sure that that young dog actually had an immune, like, had a response to the vaccine and created right. antibodies and then you're just good. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. the, the way that the, uh, there's so much variation on how titers are used. I mean, there's some veterinarians that are doing a titer every year. It's like, why? <laughs> you know, because there you don't need to. There and it doesn't it doesn't give you any more information. And this is the whole point. You're not they're not using the titer for the reason it was created. Okay. A titer is not a substitute for a vaccine. A titer is a way to find out if the immune system has responded. Yeah. And based on what you're saying, which makes sense, even if you're not showing levels of antibodies that they would consider to be protective, they're still there and they will yeah. pop up again if if they're exposed to that particular yeah. virus. Now, now that's, that is the concept that we use at our hospital and a lot of holistic practitioners sort of follow that route. Um, but is there resistance in the community? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, as in, if, if we... We, we would tell people, because, because of the guidelines that actually say nine years, 
we would actually vaccinate dogs and give them, give them a certificate that says this is good for nine years. Okay. And then we had people that moved, you know, out of the area, they saw another veterinarian and that veterinarian is saying, well, where did you get that information? And we'd show them and they wouldn't believe it. So they still wanted to you know, look at doing something. And the clients would say, well, you know, well, Dr. Jeff says it's good for nine years. And this vet says it's only good for, for three. And my, my answer on that one always was, well, can you get that veterinarian to actually show something that it expires at three years? Because yeah. there isn't. There's no such thing. Um, but the, yeah, unfortunately, uh, we're seeing a bigger problem now. And that is in the mid-1990s, um, a lot of veterinarians moved from one year to three year vaccines. And then as more people got into it, they started like me started looking at it going, I think we can go longer. And we did. Okay. But what's happening in the last decade is that there's a fair number of uh, veterinary practices that are being swallowed up by the corporations and they have a standard vaccination protocol. And so they say, yep, even a Yorkie that's in an apartment and never gets out on the artificial turf to even go pee uh, still needs to have vaccines for every, everything, core and non-core, every year, which is, you know, we got a problem with that. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> make first, sense. First, obviously, Yorkie, yeah. you know, and, and we know that they have more health problems with more vaccines, right? Because they're, but they're little tiny guys, right? Yeah. And, and then yeah, they, they get the same dosage as a, as a larger dog as well. Yeah, uh, there was a, a I call it preliminary trial done by Dr. Jean Dodds about 15 years ago now, uh, where she used a half dose. And she actually logged it and they ch checked it. And guess what? It produced a good immune response. Was that taken up by the vaccine companies? No. No. So there's so the same dose for... Uh, a 3.2 pound Yorkie and 182 pound Great Dane. There's, there's no difference between. Okay, yeah, so. but that doesn't make sense. You wouldn't do well, that with any other drugs you're administering. So why would you do it with a vaccine? Yeah. Well, they argue that it's not a drug. It's immune stimulant. Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I, I I don't agree with that either. You know. But anyway, yeah, there is a still a problem there. But the point is, we want to get the vaccine numbers down. And the this is a very simple way to do it. And it's got scientific validity, you know, for sure. Because you know, we, can, we can measure it tighter. And the, the guidelines said that it can last that long. So everything's on, you know, on board for us. Um, but there is a lot of resistance. And uh, un unfortunately, it's... It's not getting any better. It's uh, we've got a lot of veterinarians that have gone back to an annual schedule, which is. Now, do you uh, think that's because they want to make the profit of the annual vaccine schedule, or it's because the pharmaceutical companies are pushing selling more vaccines, or just ignorance on their? I I don't think the vac uh, the vaccine companies are pushing the like the core vaccines in that way. Um, there's uh, I think what it is is that. Uh, you, you have hospitals that are saying, if we don't send a reminder, you're not going to bring your dog in. Okay. And there's, there's got some creative ways that they've sort of figured things out. And that is, well, make it so that you're giving a vaccine every year, but not the same one every year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's when you get into all the non-core vaccines, you know, as in should you be doing the ones, um, you know, for uh, the kennel cough complex, for one, Lyme disease, leptospirosis, all, all those guys, right? And there's actually very little justification for doing those vaccines as well. Yeah. So. But then you also run into like dog kennels and grooming places and stuff like that that will require, the, especially the yeah. Bordetella, the, the kennel cough. So it's hard to when you're trying to reduce vaccines and then you have a dog that you need to, you know, maybe board somewhere or get groomed. The, yeah, there are some kennels uh, and certainly the way it was where, where, where I was practicing. I left practice uh, just just actually just over three years ago now. And now I'm just educating. Uh, but the, the way that we set that we had the um, certificate that said it's good for nine years. OK, and what we had with the kennels was. 
Well, we'll accept dogs in for boarding kennels, is what I'm talking about, and daycare. We'll accept them in as long as they're up to date according to the veterinarian they go to. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so we, we were good there. But there, there was one kennel, and, and the, the, that kennel uh, used uh, or was affiliated with the veterinary hospital very strongly that did annual vaccines. And so our clients could not go there. You know, because they insisted on either annual or every three year on the core vaccines. And it's just like, guys, you know, you're, you know, but they, they're busy, so they didn't care, you know, and it was a good kennel from otherwise. Uh, but they, re they were really on board from their veterinarian's recommendations. So it depends a lot who is giving them advice on what to do. Okay. So what would you recommend to um, some of the animal owners that are watching this now that have a vet that maybe isn't on board with what we're talking about? Um, how would they try to convince them that they don't want to do this vaccine schedule that they're trying to push on them? Okay. Well, there's, there's two things I would do. Um, one is get a ton of information on this. Now, this isn't stuff that you can just go on the internet, do a search and, and find it because you're going to find stuff all over the map. Um, it has it, it has to be fed to you properly. It's about the best way to put it. And uh, I'll, I'll be uh, giving my website. There's, a, there's not actually just the my blog, but also I have a course called Vaccine Mastery. So that way you learn everything. And it's not just core vaccines. It's all the other uh, vaccines that you can do. And, and so what that goes into, and this is what you need to know, it goes into what the disease is, how well does the vaccine work, what are the risks of the vaccine, and then what's a logical place to go with it. Okay, so you need to know that. If you don't have that information, you're going in just, uh, and I'll be blunt, you're going in with an attitude, and that's it. Okay, so, the, so that's really what you need to know. You need to get your background sorted out. The next thing is, once you've got that, then you have to be sort of willing to go and talk to the veterinarian and say, hey, and very simply, when they say, oh, it looks like Sparky's due for the vaccines, and then you you should be able, and this is why I need to learn, you should be able to then say, can we talk about that first? And then start getting into what, what you're looking at. The some And this is the problem. Some veterinarians are receptive to that. They will talk to you and they'll go, well, that's really interesting. I don't really believe what you're talking about, but you do, and I respect that, and let's work together. That would be perfect, okay? Uh, but there's a fair number of veterinarians that say, well, that, that doesn't fly at all. It's BS. And I, you know, I, I want to do, give vaccines every three years. And I know there's some veterinarians, and this is the same way they, if you're feeding a food that they don't approve of, you know, and they'll say, well, we really can't support that type of thinking here, you know. So and then they so, just have to find a new vet at that point. Unfortunately, if, if you want to stand your ground or if you want to do that, yeah. And see, see, we had the practice where people came to, you know, as, as in they were, they argued with their vet and they said, all the vet wants to do is just give a vaccine. And they come to us and say, what, what? and it's just so funny seeing these people because they come in, for, you know, for an quote exam, and then they just quietly ask the question. So, do you think he's due for any vaccines? And uh, and then I would turn around and says, "Well, oh, let's talk about that." And uh, and then they would sort of realize that, oh, I'm not going to be on them for not vaccinating. Quite profound, you yeah. know. So you need to find find those veterinarians that are going that route and it's just a question of calling around and ask the ask the hospital you know how how often are you recommending the core vaccines and that's the ones you should be talking about okay yeah and i found i found that a lot of uh seems like a lot of the newer vets and especially a lot of the vet hospitals around here are really open to um not pushing vaccines mm -hmm. but as you mentioned most of those practices have also been purchased by corporate companies now so they can have their own kind of regulations that maybe the individual vet may not agree with, but you know the corporate companies. Yeah, their yeah. Own. and that, and that's what does happen. the The corporate uh, ideology is that they have a blanket vaccine protocol that they have throughout because that's the one that's in their computer system. <laughs> you know? 
problems. So, so you have to do it that way. But I mean, there's, but so your your chances of getting variation on the vaccine programs is much higher with a mom and paw operation. Okay, yeah. this hopefully gone holistic route. Mm -hmm. That's what you're. Yeah, which, which a lot more vet practices and that I've seen anyways are taking on more of a holistic approach and you see more and more um vets at least in this area i don't know what it's like in other places but recommending like raw diets and more species oh, okay yeah where, where where i am and this i love this and i'm in canada a uh but where i am uh the number of holistic practices is pitiful uh and uh there's and we've got people who you know came to us who were berated by their veterinarians for feeding the blasphemous raw diet, you know. So unfortunately, yeah, it, it is a it's, it's a tradition for some veterinarians to really work on that. Okay. And uh, ironically, I, I I was doing some research this morning for uh, and like another talk that I'm putting together for my my clients, and it's just so funny because I I got this one from this very conventional veterinarian and she was just talking about all the things wrong with raw and i use that as a beautiful template because okay now we're going to do a rebuttal on everything here you know yeah and it's, and it's easy easy to do okay so yeah it's definitely. crazy how you can have such different opinions on um on nutrition to where they can say you need to feed this science diet or prescription diet versus somebody else saying raw is the way to go and they're just such different diets um yeah but this is this is the key um think of the human experience when i go and see my doctor which is not very often but whenever i do do you think he even dares bring up the idea of what i'm eating most of the time no Does, doesn't have time and hasn't had training okay and the and it's the same thing with veterinarians when they graduate when they graduate, they haven't had the training. They, they took, when I went to school, we had a whole hour on nutrition for dogs. That was it. Okay. We had far longer on how to feed a, a, a gal. Um, but the, anyway, we had our hour on dog nutrition. And guess where all the material came from? The company, a small, the dog food. A, small, a small company called, I think it's called Hills. Okay. So that's, that's where it came from. So, yeah, it was following that whole mantra. A good food, when I graduated, was a complete and balanced one, such as Purina Dog Chow. So there you go. Um, things have changed hugely, you know. And so, but the problem is that the education vets get comes from the food companies. You can call them pharmaceutical companies. Uh, it comes from there. And so unless they've really got an interest in really getting into nutrition, and that's the same way it is with people, you know, and that is you've got to have an interest in nutrition to find out how to feed yourself. Exactly. And, yeah. and that's what you've got to do with your, your dogs and cats and rabbit, rabbits, whatever you have, right? I just interviewed somebody yesterday for another uh, conference I'm doing, and she was talking about malnourished horses. Really interesting because they're using processed food in horse land. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it causes a lot of allergies too. Allergies, but also it's just, yeah, deficient in nutrients or excesses in toxins, mm -hmm. one of the two. All right. So, so anyway, the, the problem is that uh, veterinary medicine is slow to change. And, uh, and in some cases it changes the wrong way. But the key is for everyone should be taking uh, control of their dog's health. That means making decisions on vaccines, food, and the third one, toxins. If you're putting a monthly flea preventive on or you're giving heartworm every month or doing something like that, that's called a toxin, guys. And uh, we've really got to cut down. Some of the newer ones are really bad in terms of neurological issues. So yeah. we do Hopefully. have to be careful with all that stuff too. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Well, this has been uh, very informative. Just tell everybody now how they can find you, how they can find that course you mentioned that will go into um, the vaccines. Sure. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. The you know if people want to find me, it's very easy. New Earth Vet, one word. Dot com. 
Okay, so newearthvet.com. And if you go to the homepage, you'll see a thing that says free ebook, or actually there's a, I think there's a thing that comes up saying, hey, you just want a book. Uh, fill that in, you'll get, get on my newsletter list. Um, there's also a catalog with the courses there. But uh, the main thing is just, just start there and start getting the newsletter and you'll be, you'll be able to see some of the stuff that uh, we're, we're putting out. Okay, and but there, I've got a vaccine course. I've got another one on nutrition, and a whole lot of other courses too. So you can learn. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time for uh, meeting with us. And yeah, thank you, Doctor. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you.